Romantic music. For many romantics, music was the supreme art because it is the most capable of personal expression. When we talk of music in the Romantic era, we have to talk first about Beethoven. Beethoven manifests many characteristic Romantic attitudes, a love of nature, a passionate belief in individual freedom, and just human passion in and of itself. He is considered to be the pioneer of musical Romanticism. He transcended his age and set the tone for the music of the 19th century. A famous quote about Beethoven says, There will always be thousands of princes, but there is only one Be Beethoven. Beethoven's, Beethoven's music was deeply rooted in the classical tradition, but he infused the formal structure with personal autobiographical emotions. We know how he feels all the time. He was born in Bonn, Germany. His dad was an alcoholic who pushed and abused him. Beethoven worked as a private tutor for a while and met a man who helped him go to Vienna and study with Haydn. Beethoven began going deaf in 1796 and by 1802 he was totally deaf. Now those are important dates to remember as you see the dates of these compositions. 1796 was when he began losing his hearing, 1802, totally deaf. His pathetic or sonnet number no. 8 in C minor is the first piece of music that was what we now expect Beethoven to be. It is rooted in classical principles, but he pushes those classical forms to their limits. And there's an autobiographical emotionality in his work. It's personally emotional. It's not universal emotion. It's personal emotion. Other composers had infused music with emotion before, but their emotion was more universal. Here, Beethoven's emotion is personal. His music always tells us how he feels. And after this sh slideshow, you'll be able to listen to a portion of the pathetic. Really listen to these recordings. I think you'll appreciate the complexity of them. He wrote Eroica in 1806, <clears throat> so totally deaf at this point. Um, it's also called Symphony No. 3 in E flat, and it was written for Napoleon until he declared himself emperor. And so he writes it to the memory of a great man. And as with much of Beethoven, there's a classical structure um, with very romantic elements. So in other words, classical principles, but definitely autobiographical emotionality. Next is probably the most well-recognized composition by Beethoven. It's Symph Symphony No. 5 in C minor. And again, I have this for you to listen to. You will immediately recognize it. And this is often played um, over and over again, even in popular culture. And in this symphony, he moves beyond any classical sense of balance, and it's pretty much full of passion, almost agitation at times. And this is really the first time a composer maintains such emotionality, emotional intensity throughout an entire symphony. Now, after Beethoven, we need to talk about um, a particular artist, particular composer that um, really also gives us a taste of the romantic concerns and the romantic spirit in um, music. After Beethoven, music would never again return to the objectivity of the classical symphony. And those who followed him, like Berlioz, a very distinguished French composer, they searched for new ways to express their feelings. In the Fantastic Symphony, 
we have the description of the hallucinations of an opium-induced dream. Does that sound familiar, sort of like Kupla Khan? To focus on individual feelings and emotions. The part that I have for you to listen to is from the last movement called the Witch's Sabbath. Chopin is another famous Romantic era composer. And he is often called a virtuoso, which just means one with special knowledge and skill, especially as it refers to music. Beethoven's emphasis on the individual inspired some Romantic composers to move beyond the symphony form. Chopin was from Poland but lived most of his life in Paris. And he spent much of his time writing Nocturne, Nocturnes, a short piano piece in which an expressive melody floats above the rest of the accompaniment. And he expresses his own personal feelings. He's not concerned with form, but feelings, what he calls the soul of the piano. And Prelude number 28 is a famous nocturne by Chopin. Finally, opera in Germany. We turn to Wagner. In the 19th century, opera became very popular in Germany. Um, the opera in the Baroque period had become increasingly concerned with the grandest of the music at the expense of the drama or the plot. Wagner, though, reclaimed the storyline for the opera. His idea of Gismontzik's work, or the complete artwork, believed that the most powerful form of expression united music, painting, and poetry in one work. So he did it all. He wrote the words, the music, and designed and built the sets. The Wagnerian characteristics of opera are these. There's a musical flow from the beginning to the end with no pause. There's an elimination of gratuitous vocal display. The orchestra is emphasized. And he pr introduces this idea of the leitmotif, or leading motif. Wagner gave each main character, idea, and object an individual musical theme of its own. Then he could recall and combine them or change them to create a highly complex psychological drama. Again, he sought for universal emotion. One of his most famous operas is The Ring of the Nibelung. He drew most of his subjects here from German myths. And the Ring of the Nibelung is his most monumental achievement. It has four separate um, operatic dramas in it. The Rheingold, the Valkyrie, Siegfried, and the Twilight of the Gods. It represents the end of the world and includes themes like power corrupts. We're going to listen again after this to part of the Valkyrie called the Ride of the Valkyries. The job of the Valkyries in the opera is to carry the bodies of dead warriors to Valhalla. It's very wild, exotic, and typical of Romanticism. And it becomes the theme for Apocalypse Now, um, the very famous movie about the Vietnam War. So as you listen to the recordings after this show, um, listen for the, just the emotion um, that comes out of them that is so important to the romantic spirit. <laughs> 